And I believe okay, so we're live. Hello. We're live. This is David Chen from YouTube.com slash Dave Chensky. I'm here with Patrick Willems, the man behind the channel and the channel behind the channel. Patrick Willems, how are you doing this morning? I'm, I'm doing great, Dave. How are you? I'm doing well. We're here to talk about your latest video, uh, which yeah. is about how IMAX made Christopher Nolan a better filmmaker, right? That's it. And before, by the way, go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. Do yes. you have the link there? Yeah, I'm, I'm giving you the link right now. You know, oh, this great. Is a seamless process that we're doing uh, on this uh, live broadcast. Uh, for those who don't know what is happening, by the way, at the beginning of every one of these broadcasts, there's always a mad scramble to get Patrick the link so he can tweet it out. And I, I for some reason, I can't get the link from YouTube in advance. So uh, okay, it just, and now it's. Now it's doing a very weird thing. Oh, what's happening now? Okay. Um, what ha what happened to the text message oh, oh, I sent you? Oh, wait. Okay. It's really weird. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm just talking about <laughs> iMessage right now. Yeah. Okay. In my iMessage window. Here, here. I, I just sent you another one. That should work better. The one I just sent you. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yes. It's weird you. because on the sidebar, yeah. it's it said that you'd sent me the link, but it never actually appeared as a message. I agree. And and so basically, the way YouTube Live works is, uh, it, it, theoretically, there's a link where you can like post up whenever you're going live. But like we've tried that. It doesn't work. So now I hit the go live button. We wait for it to show up. Then I copy and paste it and send it to Patrick, and then he tweets it. Usually this all happens without you knowing, but uh, today, uh, it didn't happen. It, it, it was not a seamless. behind the curtain. We, we, we've, we failed a little bit. Uh, but that's what this commentary is all about, Patrick. As you said, it's about giving people a peek behind the curtain. Now, while we're yeah. finishing up that tweet situation, uh, I do want to point out that uh, we are doing a separate in-depth review of Christopher Nolan's Inception, uh, which you can find on my channel, youtube.com slash Dave Chensky. That's Dave Chen SKY. We'll also link to it in the show notes. Uh, go subscribe. Yeah, so go subscribe. Check it out. Uh, I think I've made like five videos in the time since you and I last did one of these, Patrick. Oh my now, God. Uh, the videos are not as good as yours. I wouldn't even say they're a fifth as good as one of yours. Hey, don't, um, don't, don't. But don't there are say a lot that. of them. There are a lot of them. So that's that's something that's going for me, right? Anyway. I'm very <laughs> impressed by that. <laughs> YouTube.com slash Dave Chensky. That's Dave Chen SKY. Again, link to, uh, below in the show notes. All right. So, Patrick, uh, I noticed in this video, this new Christopher Nolan video, uh, mm -hmm. that you had some uh, some new musicians taking the place of uh, of Jake and his wife. Uh, you got Chloe and Lily Holgate playing some yeah. high-quality uh, music covers for you in this, this episode. Tell us about how that came to be. Yeah, no, no shade to Jake and Rachel, who who I love very much, but I, you could maybe call this an upgrade just in terms of the fact that these are professional musicians. I uh, so basically this this kind of uh, partly this was planned and partly it was luck. Uh, since I enjoy having the uh, sort of an ongoing narrative through the videos, we were talking about. You know, potential ways to change things up uh, are just like, you know, like, you know, make each video interesting in its own way, like besides just having a new subject matter. Uh, you know, we had this idea about, oh, because people seem to like Jake and Rachel a lot. What if, you know, there was a, like a, a story where they were like, uh, like, like a network reached out to them about like spinning off into their own show. And because people the... seem to like these characters a lot. What if we had a plot line where we ripped them away from the story? I, exactly. <laughs> and then because the me in these videos is, uh, you know, kind of like a, you know, more of a control freak than I am. I felt like it could be, it could be just like a, a fun little curveball to throw into an episode to suddenly just have new musicians. And the thing is, so, uh, so Chloe and Lily uh, also went to high school with Jake, Matt, and I. So really, I, I'm just I'm friends with these pairs of siblings, Jake and Matt, and Chloe and Lily. And uh, and and Chloe and Lily, that they've I've uh, especially Chloe has been many videos that I've made before. Um, the short film that I've talked about that I was supposed to shoot in April uh, is going to star the two of them. Uh, and they're like, they're both professional musicians. That is their day job. Like their dad has a Tony award, uh, wow. for the original production of 1776. Uh, they're very talented, but also just really cool and fun people. And they also live in New York city. 
And uh, I just texted Chloe to be like, hey, do you have audio recording equipment? Could you just be our guest musician just in your apartment? Because you've got a piano there. And she said, oh, I am actually – Lily and I just came up to, to visit Saratoga for a month. Uh, and so it turned out they were both in town where I currently am as well. And, uh, so I was literally able to go drop off like gear, like yeah. audio gear for them. I, I, saw I just they, like, like look lit very, very well. They sounded good. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I shot my part, uh, and I just drove over to their parents' house and then like in the driveway, you know, in a socially distanced way, dropped off like, I uh, like audio gear, lighting gear, and then, then they, they shot their stuff. And so it worked out perfectly. I didn't think I'd get both of them. And uh, I was really, really happy to. And they, like, I knew they'd be good, and they were better than I anticipated. They took it very seriously. Yeah, it was great, and I'm definitely a fan of uh, pop music covers on classical music. Uh, I'm sorry, classical instruments, I should say. So uh, I, I fully support. I fully support this. But yes, they were great, uh, and so nicely done there. Uh, you know, Patrick. As you made this new video, I was reminded of a moment in the career of Guy Ritchie. You know the director Guy Ritchie. Uh, the director I, I, of, I'm familiar with his films. The director of movies such as... Swept uh, Away. Swept Away. Right. That was the first one I was actually going to go with. So he had made uh, Swept Away, and then he'd made Revolver, which were both mm -hmm. fairly catastrophic from a box office perspective. Mm -hmm. And... He he had essentially gotten strong encouragement from the people around him to hey maybe just go back and do the things you're good at you know go back and do the things you love, and that's when he made Rock and Roll in 2008. Now Rock and Roll was not exactly like the greatest you know gangster movie, but it was I definitely know where this is going. it was definitely like much more in keeping with his original uh, works like Lock, Stock, and Snatch that got him famous in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why I bring that up, you know. <laughs> Maybe it's the fact that you've just made a series of videos about TCM Wine Club, Mamma Mia, and Little Woman, which were awesome videos. And uh, <laughs> then you're like, you know what? You gotta maybe I should play the hits again. And so I, I guess I'm curious, what was it that motivated you to go back to Christopher the Christopher Nolan well after all these videos? Uh, that's <laughs> a good question because yeah, uh, we've been covering a lot of less uh, especially in the landscape of film youtube uh some less conventional topics and uh and now this is kind of a pivot into the most popular of topics <laughs> into like straight down the middle like uh exactly the kind of thing that so many other people have covered uh it's true and so so i guess yeah uh, what 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 goes through your mind when you make the decision to go back to the Christopher Nolan well? Uh, so I should say this topic is an idea I've had for, I think, three years. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think it occurred to me when I was watching Dunkirk in theaters in 2017. I had this thought of, huh, I feel like Switch, or like, like the use of IMAX has kind of just like, uh, has changed the way he shoots movies a little bit. And like he, he, his shots are wider. He holds on them more. There's not as much frantic cutting of close-ups, and it just kind of sat in my head for years. And, uh, and then what happened was, uh, a friend was, uh, re watching all of Nolan's movies. And I mentioned it just like this thought. And as he was watching them, he was saying like, actually, yeah, that now that I'm thinking about it, I think, like you're right, I'm I'm noticing this, and uh, and I, this was back maybe two months ago, and I just had this thought of you know, uh, I've been really enjoying covering these, you know, uh, th these topics that are covered less frequently uh, in these kinds of videos, and about maybe every six months or so, it's nice to, like, do 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 one video that's like you know it's going to perform pretty well. <laughs> and I think the last one of those was the Star Wars video mm. in February. And so, uh, so really, like, the thing is, like, I was actually, uh, 
like this was a, a topic that I genuinely cared about and, and I had been thinking about for a long time. Uh, and so it was a combination of like, oh, that could actually be a fun video that I would enjoy making. And also the it's been a while. Maybe I'll do a video that people will watch. <laughs> So let me just be clear. I'm I'm kidding with Patrick, right? I, I think that it's awesome that you're making the videos that are on, on the undercovered uh, subjects. And I think that's very essential because of the fact that they're undercovered and they should be more covered. And it's weird that they're not more covered. I will say, having made a bunch of YouTube videos lately on my YouTube channel at youtube.com mm -hmm. slash Dave Chensky, uh, there is, uh, YouTube negs you when your videos do badly. Like on the YouTube studio app, right? You go in to check how the videos are doing and it will tell you not just the stats, but it will say your video is doing worse than usual, right? Your, your, your viewers aren't watching your video. Uh, fewer of them are watching. 33% fewer uh, viewers are watching your video than usual. Consider the fact that you might want to sprinkle in more popular topics with your exist like y this new kind of stuff that you're doing. Whatever it is you're doing, it's not working as well. It's it, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's pretty close to what it actually literally says in the text of the app. Yeah, um, so for, for those who do not have their own YouTube channels, uh, uh, they're in the creator dashboard yeah. where you get all your analytics and stuff like that. The first thing you see when you click to it is YouTube tells you in the span of time that your latest video has been out. So maybe like, eight you know, hours, two days. like eight, yeah. eight hours or, uh, or whatever. And so, uh, it tells you like in that amount of time in the first like eight hours, here's how the new video compares to your last nine videos. It gives you a top 10 list. And so sometimes, and then it will tell you things like, uh, your subscribers seem less interested in this than usual. <laughs> and so, and that's the thing. And so that, like, as, as much as like, I'm like really proud of like the, the little women video and the response to it from people who watched it was really great. It, it is a little bit disheartening yeah. to look at it and be like, Oh, this is uh, in tenth place, and YouTube tells me my subscribers are less interested. Yeah, it's, it's that's like awesome. actively telling you. YouTube is actively telling you to be less interesting in terms of what kind of content you're making, right? Right, and don't guys, take chances. Don't take any chances. Just do huge what you, surprise. Yeah. The Nolan video, number one with a bullet. <laughs> of it is far and away outpacing everything I've made for like six months. And, uh, and by the way, I do, I do want to say, I just got the go. I just texted briefly to make sure I, I, I should mention this. Uh, my friend that I mentioned who was rewatching all the Nolan movies, uh, is, is film critic Siddhanta Adlaka, who's working on, uh, who has, has written, uh, a series of, of pieces revisiting every Nolan movie in like really in-depth essays that will be going up on IGN. Uh, in like in the lead up to Tenet, whenever Tenet comes out. So I've so those we're are going, going to, to see those great. essays in three years, probably. Um, <laughs> exactly. But I, I just want to like, because he's, uh, he's been working on, on his own Nolan project. And so I wanted to, and I've been talking about this all with him. So I wanted to plug that. So definitely go check that out because yes. it's going to be great. Huge fan of Siddhanth. Um, he is a, a great thinker. I, I, I am a subscriber to his Patreon. So a big fan. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> It, I appreciate the fact that you've branched out, and also I'm happy for you, Patrick, that this one's doing well because you needed this one. No, I'm just I kid, I kid. Uh, no, all right. it, it, it's. I will say, seeing the numbers, like it does feel. Nice. It does. It feels uh, good. It feels good. It's like, oh, validation. I still yeah. got it. Um, and, but so, I, but I should be very clear. Do, it's not gonna be like like all MCU and, and David Fincher, like from here on out, yes. so I, this is not like a change in direction. So, uh, we will be taking questions from the YouTube. We're live broadcasting on YouTube. And like, uh, at the end of every one of these broadcasts, we'll like throw the, the comments up. And so I, at one point I will prompt people for your questions and then I'll start throwing them up in the chat. B but before we do that, Patrick, we actually got our first, in advance of the live commentary question on we Twitter did. recently, which is like, that's a big, that's a big, someone gave a crap enough to actually submit a question in advance of us doing this, as Wild. opposed to this just being a thing where, uh, hey, Patrick, are you around? Let's do this. Let's do this live commentary, which is generally how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's a, a thing where like one random person on the internet has submitted a question. So yeah. I really feel like we're evolving, you know, to the next step of, uh, 
I know. I, I was doing this. Okay. So here is a question. Uh, this is from Jonas Kaufman, who writes in, Hey, Patrick Willems and uh, Dave Chensky, I'm headed to a job interview, and I don't know if I'll be online for the commentary. <laughs> this is what was on his mind when he's heading to a job interview. He's like, got to make sure Patrick answers this question, <laughs> which I admire that, you know? Yeah. And, and also, Jonas, hope you got that job. Okay. Exactly. I hope I'm like, great. <laughs> I'm really curious about something. In the way that Nolan had to broaden his technique due to the limitations of IMAX, Patrick, how have you adapted to your current situation, particularly when it comes to writing scripts for your show? I'd love to know more about new show ideas and uh, changes you're going with because of the new format. Also, do you think it's making you a better video essayist having less to work with? All right. So what do you think, Patrick? That's It's a really good question, and, uh, and I, I like the... I mean, the analogy to Nolan is very flattering, obviously, but I do, th um, I'm not the first to say this, but uh, I do think there can be something very helpful about having certain restrictions, whether it's like uh, a time limit, like, you know, uh, sometimes if you have infinite resources and no one to tell you no, and all the time in the world that doesn't yield the best result, but if you have like a, sometimes, you know, limited budgets, limited resources, uh, limited time can yield greater creativity. Uh, and so, I, and so making videos during this time when, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in one place, uh, I don't have all, uh, the resources that I, I do, you know, not during a pandemic. I, I, you know, this does like change the way I, I have to approach these. And, um, and it's not quite like the five obstructions, but I definitely approach the videos. Like for instance, one big way I, I make these differently is, uh, usually, uh, for like a regular video that I made in the before times, uh, I tend to, the process is all out of order. So I'll be writing the script and I won't even write it in order. I'll have an outline and then I'll, I'll, I'll write the sections that I, I have figured out uh, the soonest. And so that might be like a section in like the second half of the video. And then I'll start shooting before it's all written. And so I'll shoot it all out of order. And then I'll often even shoot like an, another section, like the day the video is released, I'll be like, Oh no, there, I need another part about, about this thing. And then I'll, I'll, I'll write that and I'll, and I'll shoot it and add it in. And so it's a, the process is a big mess. And because of doing this talk show format, it forces me to write the entire video before I shoot it and then shoot it all in one go. Uh, so th that's been kind of a nice change. Mm. Uh, and, and also just working with, because there's always the sort of the, the, the bonus, like, like narrative components to it. Uh, it, this also kind of like, uh, limits me a little bit there. It's like, there's going to be a cold open and then there will be interactions with like the band uh, and maybe like a brief thing at the end, but, but it's often like, like, because the format is so rigid, there are, uh, I, I have to be very, uh, resourceful and, and careful with, with how I use those, those little opportunities that I, uh, for like, like narrative elements and, and, and how, and what I can do with that there. And so, uh, it, it's been kind of exciting to uh, to have to like be forced to work this way. And also it's made things more collaborative because now I have other members of the team shooting their stuff remotely uh, without me on set directing it. Uh, and so I've had to relinquish some control, uh, which was stressful initially. And then it's, but it's just consistently worked out well. So that's been really exciting for me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like I'm I'm excited to at some point get back to my regular way of working, but this has been an, a really interesting new experience. Yeah, uh, that's that's pretty cool, and I think that uh, it's it, it is a uh, commonly spoken of thing that uh, having fewer resources is uh, th does help to facilitate more creativity at times, uh, and it, it sounds like it's it's kind of shaped. Uh, even the format itself has sprung from from the fact that you're kind of still at your parents' house right now, right? Right. I mean, that was my thinking at the very beginning, back in April. April, yeah, when we started doing this, was I realized if I was going to have to make videos here for an extended period of time, uh, that I kind of had to create a set format 
because I was going to uh, like a format that was like both rigid and flexible. I uh, because I they're just you know I didn't want to just sit in the living room and uh, like it, like in an armchair uh -huh. and and do it all that way. It's like 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 I I, ha I had to figure out some like like. Uh, new format, at least with, with like like a, a different kind of presentation that was sustainable. So, I, I I'm it worked out. I think one of the things that I thought was pretty impressive about uh, the way you put this one together is you counted all the camera movements in every single one of Christopher Nolan's movies. Is that right? Or at least his first ones? Uh yeah. So we actually. We did more work on this. So uh, this was a project that I worked on with uh, our great summer intern, Emma Logsdon, who was al who also interned last summer. Uh, and luckily, she's like a, a, a big fan of, of uh, particularly Inception. And so some of these uh, – so we actually did catalog even the camera moves in, in pretty much – even in like uh, – uh, Dark Knight, Inception, Dark Knight Rise. Like, like we went further with it uh, than that. Uh, but I realized it was because, for instance, I believe there are. So he, I said he uses one rack focus in Memento, Memento yeah. and then in Inception, I believe there are seventeen. Uh, so the stats uh, aren't as notable once he starts, like once his his style stops becoming quite as rigid. But uh, but we did actually do extra work that didn't make it into the video script. Just like I uh, just I, I think we we noted down we had like a shared Google Doc. Yeah. Where we noted any time he uh, he panned or tilted the camera like to reveal information, not just to follow someone. Right. Uh, anytime there was a rack focus and anytime uh, the camera revealed something by either craning or dollying. Yeah. And uh, I got to tell you, especially in those earlier movies, it did not happen a lot. Hmm. Uh, I think Emma, the intern might be in the chat. Is that right? Um, uh, Emma Lodgson? Lodgson, Lodgson yeah. I yeah. Say. Uh, uh, yes. Hello, Emma. Patrick, I think you should. First of all, it's awesome that you catalog that. I I feel like if you publish that somewhere, I think you've published that like Polygon before. Uh, but I'm sure someone would be open to, uh, kind of publishing that work of like how how the camera movements have increased in frequency and you know and usefulness over time. Yeah, you're you're not wrong. It was it was a really interesting experience going through these and just seeing the findings, and uh, I I mean like I. It blew my mind revisiting Interstellar when I was like, oh, my God, there's a crossfade. He's never done a crossfade before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, great work to both Emma and yourself. And I would love to see I would love to see like a visual. There's got to be like a way to visualize that data. That's interesting. Um, so I'd encourage right. you to explore that because I think um, there'd be people who would eat that up on the Internet. I think you're right. So uh, so consider exploring it anyway. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, that's one of the things I appreciate about this video and also the other, uh, like your Star Wars video about like the filmmaking language. It's just like, it's just the facts. It's just like, let's not even talk about like the ideas and concepts. It's just like, what is the filmmaking language of the the movies, right? And, right. Um, so your position is that IMAX really helped to open up his filmmaking style, right? And the first one of those movies would be The Dark Knight. Yeah. So basically, after The Dark Knight, which would be Inception, The Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, and Dunkirk, and then Tenet, we haven't seen yet, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but you think, like, before that, so uh, specifically The Prestige, Batman Begins, Insomnia, and Memento, and following, uh, kind of adhere to a very, uh, like, a sort of less interesting style of, uh, of filmmaking with, like, less kind of thought to the composition and um, camera movement in, in ways that will help to tell the story? Is that is that kind of, have I summed that up correctly? I, I think so. And and to be clear, I like all these movies. Uh, I'm not, I'm by no means saying, you know. Yeah, they're bad. Batman anything, Begins yeah. is bad because he shoots it in a lot of close-ups. I think, I think they succeed despite uh, what can be kind of a, some, I, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, kind of boring functional visual style. Uh, and which like occasionally in these movies, like 
Um, it's the kind of thing like you don't notice it very much, but then if you do start paying attention, it's the kind of thing that uh, I know, like, uh, uh, you know, David Boardwell, mm-hmm. uh, he's, uh, written, he has a whole ebook, uh, about just like compiling all of his pieces about Nolan. And he's done some really great writing on it. I spent, uh, uh, over the years where like really breaking down sequences, uh, you know, in Nolan movies. And I know, uh, insomnia is one that he's really kind of gone pretty hard on just looking at, at, at scenes where like there's the, the scene at the beginning where, uh, Al Pacino arrives on the plane and, uh, Hillary Swank meets him on this dock and just her like getting out of a truck and walking down the dock. It's like, there's like 23 shots there. And it's such a and, and it, it's such a simple sequence, and it does and it once you start looking at it, it is kind of odd. Like almost nothing is happening, and all, all of these shots kind of communicate the same thing. Like why did he need to shoot it from this many angles? Uh, why did he need to cut this rapidly? Um, and I think I, uh, I think it's a thing that I, and I, I've seen other filmmakers, especially like early on in their career, do. I think where. Uh, they do, they, they get a lot of coverage and they do cut rapidly just to sort of keep the pace up. And I think that was his main concern, like always want, because he, he's very into these, this like really propulsive pacing through all his movies. And I think part of the cutting is just like a way, like it's kind of a simple way to, to have things feel like they're moving quickly. Uh, it, I, not necessarily artificially, but, I but like, you can do that by, you know, by if you pull back and, and hold the shots longer. But I but I think that was kind of his fallback, just like to keep cutting quickly to tight shots. So everything feels like it's 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 like intense and moving quickly. Right. Urgent. If that makes any sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's an urgency to it. There's a rhythm and a pace to what's occurring if you cut a bunch. Right. Um, I do think like. Uh, we're going to talk about Inception. We're, like, we're going to review Inception separately in a separate video, as we've already said. But as I was rewatching Inception last night, um, it does occur to me that like a lot of the weird kind of cutting, it, it hurts the most in scenes of like action scenes. I would say, uh, mm-hmm. and you pointed out like this or or uh, scenes of violence. I guess not not action scenes, m- moments of violence, right? There's one component of it, which is, I think, my sense is Christopher Nolan makes his movies to be PG-13. I, I think, uh, what, every single one of his movies is PG-13 or under, is, is, maybe Insomnia is not. Uh, uh, and, and Insomnia Memento is not. and Memento are, are rated R. Also, Following and... is probably rated R, right? Yeah. Uh, one thing, I so I had never seen Following until I watched it for this. And, uh, and Following was very, I mean, it's... It's one of those uh, first films that is where you can immediately see like like oh oh, oh th- th- like obviously certain things evolved, but this director wa- had all of his quirks like right from the very beginning. This is a Christopher Nolan movie, but it was surprising because it's like oh there's uh you know people like swear in this movie. There's right. like p- fairly regular profanity. It is like, it's implied that like people have sex at one point. <laughs> that seems crazy. Why? Uh, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Uh, it's like, it's starting with Batman begins. Like every one of his movies has been PG 13. Right. Yeah. And so I feel like he shoots for PG 13, uh, mm-hmm. in, in all of his movies. And this is evident in scenes like the opening of the dark Knight when people get shot, but there, there's no, squibs or anything like that you know what i'm saying right. like there's no blood uh and it's it just it just makes for sometimes a weird moment and specifically i'm thinking of the scene in inception where joseph gordon levitt's facing off with that guy in a hallway right one of the yeah. most spectacular action set pieces ever made right and shot in a way that really sells it to like shot in a, many shots like long continuous wide angle so and you see the gravity shifting in one shot it's amazing right there's one particular shot that i like a lot of that shot a lot of that fight plays out in one shot and especially compared to all the rest of the action scenes in the movie it's i think it, it's so astounding because it's the I think it's the longest shot in the entire film. Right. Thank thank goodness too, because otherwise it would be hard to sell. Like you could have imagined a way where he could shoot it without shooting it in one long shot, 
where it's like, okay, you shoot it, and then, hey, now you cut, rotate the room, and then, like, now... Mm-hmm. But the fact that they did it all in one shot means, like, oh, no, the room was actually rotating as they shot it. Um, so I feel like at that point, he's like, no, we have to hold it in one long shot or else people won't believe it. Um, yeah. But then there's a moment when Joseph Gordon-Levitt shoots the guy who he's fighting, mm-hmm. and it's like... It, it reminded me of that moment you talk about in the video where uh, Bruce Wayne's parents get killed, right? And it's right. just... It's so hard to even understand what exactly happened in the inception moment it's like the gun he he grabs the gun and he picks it up and there's the gunshot sound and you hear it and so then you just assume that the guy was shot and then he he's able to sell it through the audio but he's just like there's no you don't ever see the guy get shot or anything like that and mm-hmm. it, it reminded me of like yeah he's really interesting maybe maybe it's a PG13 thing maybe it's the thing that you're talking about where he's like always cutting super close and rapidly when it comes to moments of violence like that, I feel, in general. Yeah, you're totally right. And uh, I, I was there's multiple spots in Inception where this kind of thing comes up. Like in at the early on in the Mombasa chase scene, yeah. there's a part where uh, Leo is like fighting with a, like a guy on the floor and you'll see like, like a, a shot of Leo seeming to like kick his leg out and then it cuts to the other guy like falling backwards. Yeah. And, uh, and it's like, it's almost like, uh, he like weirdly sort of cutting a, like, instead of just showing this, like this action, just show like, it, just like, give us a little wide shot, just show the thing playing out a little bit. Look at, let us admire the stunt work. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it is kind of odd. Like it's the kind of thing that I would just love to talk to Nolan about because it's almost like all of these things. It's like they take a, a split second to register. Yeah. Like oh oh he just kicked him right yeah. instead of just like and I think this okay so there's a whole section of the script that I actually cut out because it was just veering away from my main point. Uh, and again it was just getting long as it was. Uh, Your about, videos get long. I know. Everyone never, longer than I've intended. I've never heard that to happen before, but okay. Um, but there was this part where I was going into, I think, uh, into Nolan's editing style and the way that his scenes, uh, like obviously his structures of like the, like the whole movie, like he likes to fragment time with like multiple timelines and stuff like that. But even the scenes themselves like to like fragment and restructure time. Uh, sometimes it's obviously the classic like cross cutting between you know, multiple scenes happening at the same time. And sometimes it's, it's as simple as, uh, you know, just like, you know, I was watching uh, Inception just this morning and there'll be a part like when they're attacking the like snow fortress and uh, and you'll see like Tom Hardy planting an explosive somewhere and then it will just cut to like five seconds later when he's around the corner and then pressing a button. Like yeah. he likes to just like, like even within a, a scene that's, happening linearly he'll just cut out these little sections of time and kind of just restructure time as it's going and uh and and really like he he, his obsession i think with editing really is just the 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 connections your mind makes between cutting from one thing to another that's why he he prefers to cut from one thing to another than to move the camera from one thing to another and it and it it's it's a thing that I, again I I don't know if it's like how intentional it is but when it comes to to his action a lot of the time instead of showing the action he forces your minds to make the connection between showing one action and then showing a reaction to it mm-hmm. and anyway I I have so many things I want to ask Nolan about but I don't think this is a major problem but it is like a weird quirk in in his style that I'm just curious about. It's interesting, though. There's also, like, many counterexamples to that, right? I, I think that despite kind of what you're saying about his rapid cutting style, the fact that he holds, like, the shots are very tight, the guy knows how to sell a really spectacularly done set piece, right? Mm-hmm. And it is possible to flip over an actual semi truck on a, a Chicago street and have it not look like you actually did that. Right. Like right. you can, you could flip it over and then you cut it so much or so close that like people are like, Oh, that's CG or, Oh, he didn't, they didn't really do that. It's all, you know, it's a miniature or whatever. Right. It's a, there's, you can film it in a way that makes it look bad. And right. he does not do that. Right. I, I mean, yeah. when, when there is a huge, 
Uh, object colliding with another object. He knows how to shoot and cut it in a way that really sells that they did that in the real world. Another example being the train in Inception. Like, you believe that there was a train barreling through the streets of wherever they were. Um, and it's because these are, like, longer shots. They're often wider angle, right? They're often mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, uh, we're, we're far back from the subject. You can see everything that's happening. We're going to hold it and watch you watch this whole thing. Just let it, let it play out in camera. Uh, so at the same time as I, I agree with what you're saying, I do think at times he knows like when he needs to like back away from the cutting and like let things play out. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think, uh, there's definitely a difference between sort of like up close, like small scale violence and the, you know, the, like the money shots, uh, yes. because like he, he, yes. he knows when it's, when it's you know, a semi truck flipping over when it's a train in the street, when it's the rotating hallway fight scene, when it's the, 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 the mountain, that's really a wave and interstellar. I, he knows that, okay, this is like, this is definitely more important than the random goon getting shot. Like this, (laughs) this we have to sell. We have Uh, to see this now. (laughs) Right. And that kind of gets into the the part I talked about in the video with the, the docking sequence in interstellar, Mm. uh, that, I mean, one of the most badass moments in all of sci-fi, as far as I can tell. I love it. Even it's just so watching great. it, watching it again on just a TV screen, uh, with uh, what may be my favorite Hans Zimmer score ever playing. Uh, it's it's still stunning, and I, I think again his his approach to those big spectacular moments. It's like the bluntness of his filmmaking approach. It's, I mean, like look at the semi truck flipping over. He just he just points the camera at it. It the camera doesn't do anything complicated. It's just a very wide shot dead on and uh and that's that's all you need for it like he understands that you know sometimes uh simplicity is key and uh and interstellar is also really interesting because a lot of the movie's uh visual style was done to imitate actual nasa footage right right and uh that nasa footage meaning oftentimes you have like a stream of video that's like continuous for like, you know, an hour and it's just like a camera strapped to the side of the vehicle and that's it. Like, Mm -hmm. and there was vast stretches of that movie. That's just like literally a camera strapped to the side of the vehicle and you're looking out from that perspective. Um, And uh, so I did think that that kind of lent it a real air of authenticity, even as the spaceships are doing things that, you, obviously they didn't actually do in real life, right? Like, it's like, oh, right. it, it, it's it's a way of, like, tricking your brain into being like, oh, this is actually, this is, like, the other actual real thing I actually saw, right? But yeah, this I, is I not mean, real, and but it, I think it's real because it's, you know, it's, like, very similar from a visual perspective. Right, so I mean, I the thing it. with that sequence is the, the camera is just, like, mounted on, yes. like, the outside, it, it's just not moving. It's just, like, like they clamped or bolted it down onto the, the top of, like the like the craft, and that's just it. It's just sitting there, or like basically as if it were just one of those NASA cameras, just recording and documenting what's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's it's really effective. All right. So uh, let me ask you this last question, and then we'll get to mm-hmm. audience questions. Um, is there anything else you found while you were looking through all of Nolan's films that kind of surprised you? You obviously had a kind of thesis when you went into this. It sounds like you're like. Hey, his storytelling has evolved, in, or his visual style has evolved in these ways. But as you're going through all the movies, was there anything you saw that kind of surprised you and made you feel like, "Oh, I didn't see that coming"? Everything okay, Patrick? <laughs> Sorry, my dad was trying to get into this room and interrupt the call. We're doing it live, uh, folks. We're doing dad. it live. We we have no net here. We're walking the tightrope with no net, folks. I can't believe this is the first time that that. You know, I've had a, a parent interrupt this. Also, this is the most viewership we've had in the live room ever, I think. We have around oh my god, We have around 240 people watching right now. So, that's amazing. Uh, anyway, to repeat my um, question, Patrick, anything that surprised yeah, you in your anything uh, movies? Anything that surprised me. Um, that is, uh, like, honestly, I, 
I, these are all movies I've seen multiple times. Uh, what surprised me the most was just how huge an evolution the prologue of The Dark Knight felt like. Uh -huh. uh, just watching it in this context yeah. of just... It, like was seeing, unlike, it was unlike anything he'd ever done before visually, as far as you could tell, right? Right. Yeah. Suddenly, uh, you know, just the shots are so deliberate and like the filmmaking is so much more confident yes. than I feel like it had been before then. Uh, it's like, it's like, you know, he would, uh, like, like I said in the video, it's like, uh, he was finally trusting the shots. He didn't have to just like cut every time, like someone moved somewhere or looked somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it, like every little action didn't have to be its own close up. Suddenly he was, he was realizing that like, Oh wow. no, we're going to move the camera in this direction and it's going to turn this way and look from one thing to another. Uh, and we're going to guide I, the audience's eye from this to the thing. We don't need to just focus on one thing and cut to it. Right. Yeah. It was, it was really surprising and, uh, and exciting. And obviously like that's, that sequence is so iconic. I uh, like already and watching it this time, it's, it's the most impressed by it I've been since that initial, you know, viewing in July 2008 when I saw it in theaters. Yeah. Uh, well, very cool. Congrats on the new video. Uh, let's get to questions in the chat. And as people are typing in their questions, I do just want to remind you that um, Patrick and I will be doing a review of uh, Inception to celebrate the occasion of its 10th anniversary of release, which Ten was years. yesterday by the way, I believe, right? Or I think it was yesterday. I believe it was yesterday. Yeah. So uh, make sure you subscribe to my channel to see that at youtube.com slash Dave Chensky. That's Dave Chensky. Actually, no, it looks like it was July 13th, 2010. So it was actually this week. I was I, I was talking about this yesterday with Emma, uh, and there is apparently some debate about what the actual day is. Apparently, like most people recognize it as I believe the either 15th or 16th, but then Joseph Gordon-Levitt uh, was like talking about it on the 13th. Right. And it's one of those things where, you know, there's always, movies have like a Friday release date, but really open at like on Thursday at 7 p.m. So it's complicated. July 13th, 2010 was a Tuesday. So okay. maybe maybe it like opened in IMAX earlier or something like that. I don't I don't who knows what it was. Anyway. I know. Maybe who maybe gives a crap? The whatever the case, was ten years since inception. Ten years. <laughs> um and Emma Logs Logsden says it's complicated. Inception fans chose the sixteenth so we can celebrate at the same time. Yeah, the sixteenth would be the Friday of that release, so Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple questions in the chat room. Beatmaster says, did Nolan get held back by Wally Fister and vice versa? Maybe some thoughts on Fister himself that haven't made it into the episode. Didn't Fister shoot The Dark Knight, though? Uh, Fister shot everything up to The Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, so uh, this question, I, I, I disagree with the premise of the question, basically. You could maybe make the argument that they both evolved together, right? But Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Uh, Fister was right there uh, as like the main collaborator during this evolution. Uh, you look at um, I uh, one sec. I, I want to pull this up because I was having this conversation on on Twitter last night, uh, and this is this is this is very relevant. I promise. Um, I will have. Do you want to send it to me? I can. If you, if you text to me, I can put it up in the chat. I. Yeah, I will have it. Okay. Um so with uh Kyle Kizu, um I I was talking with him. He pointed out he uh he sent me a thread that I uh, I uh, he a year ago he wrote an article for the Hollywood Reporter about uh theorizing what what Nolan would do with Tenet and he he had this long thread where he broke down the average shot length mm. of Nolan's action scenes throughout his his filmmaking of like he also was had been talking like you know a year before me I did I didn't know about this until last night about the evolution in his filmmaking that IMAX caused and uh and for instance like action scenes in Batman Begins uh the shot average shot length is 1.6 seconds 
And and for instance, like the fight scene in The Dark Knight Rises with uh, where Batman fights Bane, the average shot length is three seconds. Mm. So basically, the shots are twice as long uh, from well, the first Batman. It doesn't sound that long when you say it like that, but it actually is a big difference, right? Yes, like you can feel absolutely. It. You can feel that that difference in shot length. Right. And so, uh, and that was Fister, uh, you know, like shooting dart, uh, shooting all the Batman movies. And so, uh, so yeah, I don't think Fister was holding him back. I, th- I, I think Fister was, uh, you know, was doing this right along with him and, uh, and, and, and the work was evolving while Fister was still working on it. So, uh, so yeah, that's my take on that. All right. Um, let's see. By the way, I'm very curious to see, I uh, like uh, so apparently Wally Pfister, from what I have been told, it will never go back to cinematography is o- will like only is a director now mm-hmm. and only wants to like I uh, like be he doesn't like to consider himself a cinematographer. He's uh, he's just a director. And obviously he made the movie Transcendence, which didn't go great. Uh, and Correct. so. So I'm wondering, do you think he'll make a movie again? He's he's done TV. He's done. I know he's done a lot of commercial work, which pays more than movies do. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to to look at someone who has done something like that and feel like, hey, man, why don't you just stick with what you know? You know, um, because he has shot some of the best looking movies of all time, uh, mm-hmm. as far as I I'm concerned. Uh, the Dark Knight being one of them. I mean, I think that's a gorgeous looking movie overall. And it's like, hey, why don't you just keep keep doing this thing that you're extremely successful at? Uh, but I think everyone deserves the room to self actualize in whatever way they want. Uh, so I don't know whether he's going to make another movie, but I hope that whatever he's doing, he's happy about it. Patrick, that's yeah, my I mean, position I, on it. <laughs> I see uh, uh, Robert Piscatelli in the comments saying Fister thinks he's Jan de Bont. And uh, Jan Devon is another case of a great cinematographer who actually had what was for several years a very successful directing career, and then it just ended. Yeah. Like, you know, Jan Devon came out the gate so strong with Speed and then Twister, and then Speed 2 was just like the beginning, just, just like just dragged it all down. And he hasn't made a movie since Tomb Raider 2. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this in our last commentary as well. You know, sometimes it just happens. Yeah. Uh, movies are hard to make. It's hard to convince people to give you millions of dollars to make a movie. And then, this is, then it's hard for that movie to be released in a theater and it's hard for it to be seen by people. It's just it's true. really tough. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, Sid has a question here. Best Nolan score by my boy, DJ David Julian. <laughs> Oh man, David Julian. Uh, I think so. I he composed it's... a score to following Memento, Insomnia, and The Prestige. Yeah, my I favorite hit... one is still is Memento. I, I think okay. it is a very haunting score that still sticks with me to this day. I uh, I do like that one. I I think I've got to give the edge to The Prestige, which honestly might be just my favorite Nolan movie in general. I mm. uh, but yeah, but. It's interesting because I think especially in the prestige where the per, I saw the score was like produced by Zimmer, uh, you can definitely see the way that like the similarities in their approach and why Nolan was like, I like what Julian's been doing, but Zimmer does a similar thing, but it's bigger. <laughs> but yeah, I, always, I, I, I I always feel for those little guys, you know, the people who are like. Um, basically the composers that directors work with before they work with Hans Zimmer. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it actually, uh, this came up recently because Ryan Johnson recently made Knives Out. Mm-hmm. And he, his first couple movies were composed by Nathan Johnson, who's a brilliant musician uh, and also related to Ryan Johnson. He's I've interviewed, cousin, right? I've interviewed Nathan a couple times, yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> And then he he uh, worked with John Williams for Star Wars, one of the greatest, pro- probably the by my book the greatest film composer of all time. Okay, it's just it's in John my, Williams. In my opinion, other people disagree. Um, and 
but th- th- then I'm like, oh man, is Ryan Johnson only going to work with the big shots for now? But then he went back to work with Nathan Johnson. Now, Nathan Johnson, a v- super well known, well regarded musician. I'm not saying like Nathan Johnson's not famous, but he's not as big as John Williams, right? Right. So uh, I was just like, oh man, that's cool that like uh, Ryan Johnson like remembered the people who like helped him to like rise to power, you know? And I mean, the thing with, I mean, I, I, I... I say this like like David, you actually know Ryan Johnson, but I, so I like I'm speaking out of turn here, but I, but one thing that I, I love is that he brought like his whole yes, crew his over whole to Star crew. Wars. Yeah, yeah, like his you know his, his producer, his cinematographer, like everybody. He it's just like he brought the family along, and I think it's like the rule with Star Wars is like you can bring everybody except your composer because Johnny Williams, you know, he's got to do it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that would be he, he, he would Ryan would be unreasonable if he suggested otherwise, basically, right? right. So, uh, but anyway, uh, it 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 has kind of been a like it would be interesting to see like a uh, well Inception the score is so good. I mean, I can't say like someone else shouldn't have ri- should have written that score, but it would have been interesting to see like what would you know David Julian have done with like um, Interstellar right. or something like that. I'd I mean, very Interstellar curious. score is also pretty good, but you know. And I, I do honestly think like like Zimmer does a lot of scores, and there are <laughs> and and there are the some Zimmer scores. I uh, feel like oh he kind of maybe phoned this one in or like he kind of had like you know how he has remote control his whole studio where a lot of other composers yeah. like Steve Jablonski or Klaus Badelt and yeah. stuff like that like got their start. Like sometimes I I feel like Zimmer just sort of like let the other guys he there work on this. this one out. But you, exactly. you I don't I don't feel that way for his Nolan scores though. No, the Nolan ones, yeah. those are the ones that you could, that it's like he put his like he brought his A game to those. He right. really cared about like I think um especially like uh, I mean, obviously, the first two Batman movies were collaborations with James Newton Howard, but uh, but like pretty much everything he's done with Nolan, I think it's some of the best work Zimmer has ever done. They like, exist interse- as their own musical work, basically, right? You can, like, yeah, p- people they have been used in so many other things. You can listen to them independently; they sound amazing. So, and, he, and they're so experimental. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You yeah. look at. Like there's a, a, that great uh, Vox video essay about how the Dunkirk score yeah. works. Yep. It's it, it's uh, it's incredible work. And that said, I am so excited to hear what Ludwig Göransson does with uh with Tenet because I love. I think he's a great composer. He's and, amazing. Uh, and he did uh, did he do? No, he didn't. What, what, what did he do? I, I was going to say Sicario, but I, I don't think that's him. That's that well, was Johan uh, Johansson, right? He won his Oscar for Black Panther. Yes, that's right. And uh, but he has such a wild career because he was the composer composer for Community, and then he started working with Donald Glover there, and so he produced like all the Childish Gambino music. Yeah, and then got into film composing. Like he did The Mandalorian. Uh, right. He, oh, he, amazing, he, amazing score for Mandalorian. So, such a yeah. such a fresh take on what a Star Wars universe score could be. That right. The Mandalorian. It's, right. It's like I think he's really excited. Like uh, I. I think the Black Panther score is far and away the best MCU score. I know that's not like there isn't a whole lot of competition, uh, but it, Alan it's Silvestri just, would like a word, sir. I I like Alan Silvestri's work, but you uh, like I remember when I rewatched all of those movies in a row, get into the Black Panther score and something like, oh my god, they're like <laughs> this is like catchy and like like it's not right. it's not just sort of you know kind of generic superhero music. Uh, I think he's a really cool composer, and I, I think it's really interesting that Nolan has a new composer and a new editor on Tenet. Mm. Uh, no, Lee Smith isn't editing this one. He got the editor for Hereditary, which I have no wow. idea what that will be, I just, I, but I can't wait to see what it is. Oh, he also did the music for Patriot Act with Hasan Minhaj, which I, I love that theme song. Oh. Uh, Interesting. So uh, Rohit D- uh, Dar asks, is there any filmmaker currently that you think could benefit from the use of IMAX cameras in terms of cinematography and overall visual aesthetics like Nolan? I mean, you didn't talk about this in your video, Patrick, which um, is understandable, but we're obviously living in a really weird time right now with uh, theatrical film going. Um, are we? Most of the theaters in the country are closed due to the global pandemic that's happening. There's no... Uh, because of how poorly the pandemic has been managed in the United States, there's no path to 
uh, no clear path to them being open right now, as far as I, I can tell. Like yesterday, people were predicting that it would be until mid 2021 that, um, you know, uh, that uh, that would be when movies theaters would reopen again. And it's kind of a bummer because uh, one thing that's great about Nolan's IMAX work is that he truly helped to make movie going along with like things like the MCU, he helped to make movie going into an event again, right? It's mm-hmm. like a thing where you, it, it's not just a thing that's like slightly better than your TV. It's like, you must go to the theater to witness this. And by the way, super ambitious stories. It's not just IMAX to tell, it's not just an IMAX. Um, I mean, I love the way hateful eight looks, you know, uh, but, it, and uh, Quentin Tarantino shot that on 70 millimeter, but it's not just like, you know, eight or nine people in a room talking. It's like, right. we are going to visually dazzle you. You must go yeah. see this in a, the biggest theater possible or else you will be having an inferior experience. And like, I love... Dave, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm pretty sure in, in Seattle, do you, like I do in New York, have your your one theater that yes. you have to see a Nolan movie at? 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, although I would see Tenet in any theater at this point, actually. Like, <laughs> that's just me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hold out for the actual main event, right? Um. So, uh, on the one hand, he did help to like kind of make IMAX movie going into an event. On the other hand, by very nature of the fact that there aren't that many true IMAX screens in the country, right? That are at that at the what people such as myself refer to as true IMAX. Right, which is like the square format screen. It fills up the whole screen. You know, all that stuff. Um, it it has been pretty inaccessible for a lot of people, and is likely to become more inaccessible in the days to come because mm-hmm. of the fact that uh, movie going is in the place it is right now. Like movie theatrical film going was already in a bad spot even before right. uh, even before the pandemic, and so now it's going to be in a worse spot. And uh, it is a bummer that this movie, which is apparently one of his most ambitious movies yet, uh. And and should be seen in IMAX is going to be really difficult to see in IMAX. I I predict right. So yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but we can also answer Rohit's question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like I I I echo all your thoughts. It's uh, I like I have no I I don't have any answers about like the the what's going what's happening or what's going to happen with movie theaters. Uh, other than I can say I miss them. And uh, I am I'm I've, I'm dying to see a movie in a theater again. That said, I am not going to risk dying uh, to see a movie in a theater again. And so I don't know when I'll be able to again. And uh, and just just want to you know just to bring back an important point, uh, Christopher Nolan, uh, please delay Tenet. <laughs> uh, don't try to release it in like three weeks. Uh, so Rohit asked the question, is there any filmmaker you think could benefit from the use of IMAX cameras in terms of cinematography and overall visual aesthetics? And uh, I gave all that preamble to just say, you know, this, yes, we can we can blue sky this and fantasize about what directors might uh, want to use IMAX or benefit from IMAX, but IMAX itself and the- theatrical film going is deeply troubled right now. And so, you know. I, not, yeah. I actually have an answer for this. Yes, yeah, please, go ahead. Because the thing is, almost, I mean, Almost any director, I think, could probably benefit from it because, you know, most movies, like movies in general are best watched in a movie theater Yeah. Uh, on a big screen. And so it's like, wow, a bigger, more immersive screen would benefit practically anything. That said, maybe Paul Greengrass isn't the guy for it. Yes. Um, I would love to see a Terrence Malick movie mm. in IMAX. He was actually someone um, that I was thinking of a lot when you watching Nolan's movies. I think there are similarities in their editing and the kind of like fragmented moments of time. Right. Even though like Malick's movies are like, you know, beautiful tone poems and Nolan's are are like propulsive thrillers uh, about like running out of time. Uh, but uh, looking at the way that I uh, – that. Malik uses these really wide angle shots uh, in these beautiful locations with like the light in perfect places, you know, watching something like uh, 
um, a hidden life or like the tree of life. If that were shot in IMAX filling my entire field of vision, I think would be a staggering experience. And, uh, I would be really into that. Indeed. Uh, also, uh, Ra- Ragin Malaysian says uh, Quaron and IMAX would be really great. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of directors who make interesting visual, uh, visually interesting movies right now, right? Um, Give me a Wes Anderson movie in IMAX. Wes Anderson, Edgar Wright, you know, Ryan Johnson, um, all, all these people who like make really visually spectacular films, I think, uh, would benefit from IMAX. Um, you may okay. Watermelon Heart says you made nods to Tenet, but didn't seem to speculate on if the footage presented in trailers thus far reflects Nolan's continued progression. Do you think there's any support for this? I I I thought about this, and there is that Tenet prologue that played in IMAX theaters before Rise of Skywalker. Uh, so there's actually been like a little bit of like not like trailer footage, but like a, you know. Ext- an actual like extended sequence uh, released, but I haven't seen that. Uh, I didn't see Rose Skywalker and IMAX. Uh, so all I can go on is the trailers. And the thing about the trailers is obviously he shot a lot of the movie in IMAX, which has a different aspect ratio, but all the trailers are cropped to like anamorphic widescreen. Right. So you're not even, so you don't even really know which footage in there is IMAX, yeah. and which isn't. Yeah. And so I just, I, I, there just wasn't enough to go off of. Like, I, I, I didn't want to just say, like, well, I don't know, this one shot that, because it's in a trailer, is, like, a second long, but m- maybe... But maybe, it, yeah. Maybe it's, it'll it's look... really hard to judge movies based on trailers. Yeah. Right. Especially, like, how to, you know, judge, like, the craft of a film right. uh, based on trailers, which are so heavily edited. Uh, they're just wasn't enough to go off of. I didn't feel comfortable making any kind of real predictions. The Gamer's Advocate asks, are there examples of new technology making the work of a filmmaker noticeably worse? Perhaps they got better by returning to their more comfortable form later. Patrick, I'm pretty sure you made a video about exactly this topic. It's yeah, called, yeah. Uh, the Robert Zemeckis video. Y- y- it, yes, <laughs> it was the Robert Zemeckis video. And um, yes, I think that is a perfect example. Uh, I, Robert Zemeckis' best work is not the stuff he did post-2001. Um, and that was the time when he re- became very enamored with different kinds of modern technology. Yeah. Um, I think there are, are classic cases. I think honestly, uh, George Lucas, uh, I, I think, yeah, you know, great example. Uh, he's, he's, he's one of the first guys, I think, uh, Peter Jackson. Um, it's several of these people who went down the technology rabbit holes and, uh, and kind of, and became so obsessed with chasing some, some kind of goal that the audience doesn't really care about, but they are obsessed with. Oh yeah, uh, uh, I th- Ang Lee, another example that comes to mind. Um, and uh, we've also talked about Michael Mann as well. Um, yeah, Michael Mann video. is is one that people kind of go, people are more divided on. Mm. I feel like uh, in terms of his use his use of digital cameras, yeah, uh, because like. I really liked it on Collateral, and I mostly liked it on Miami Vice. I yeah. and but public, I, I have Public Enemy. It just I I under I understand what he was trying to go for. You know, mm-hmm. he's trying to give like the immediacy of like today's, uh, you know, the, the 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 style and aesthetic of today, and he's trying to bring it back to the olden days. It just wasn't to my taste. <laughs> I haven't seen it since it was in theaters, but at the time it it really bothered me because it just made everything feel fake. Uh, it, it, it felt like I was watching like a history channel, like reenactment. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, which when the, the, the point was instead to have it feel like, like really like, like contemporary and, uh, and, and, and more tangible because it's like, Oh, like these like super, uh, like high resolution digital cameras are being used in this period piece. And uh, I, it just like, it bugged me for the entire movie that said it's been a decade. I should probably just give it another look, but yeah, but, but, but he's a guy where he became very enamored with new technology and it may not have been to the benefit of the films. All right. Uh, let's do, Oh, here, here a couple questions. First of all, Suru Tetsuo says uh, James Cameron, which I just reject because yeah, 
Uh, he, the last movie James Cameron made, as far as I could tell, is the second highest grossing movie of all time. You may not like it, but I would I wouldn't say he's lost himself in his toys quite yet. Maybe when Avatar two comes out, we can pronounce this, but it's not right. It's not time yet. I think I'll, the case with a lot of these other people is they're the the big technical things they were pushing, uh, overshadowed what the pe- storytelling, right? Right, and 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 people d- just like actively rejected them. It's yes. like the, you know, the, it's the, like the mass public rejected. Them. Right, as in like I don't like the way high. Fr- frame rate works are, are, are like, uh, Peter Jackson. I don't like your all CG Hobbit movies. Uh, it is unpleasant to look at with the thing is if people don't like avatar, their complaint never seems to be the animation. It's like that. Right. The look of it is like, if people don't like it, it's usually because of the story, the, uh, (laughs) the, the technology used. I don't, the the 3d, that's a movie where 3d works. The motion capture is really effective uh yeah i i think he's actually he's a, a technology obsessed filmmaker who actually is doing it right uh all right we we're we're wrapping up here uh patrick let me know if you have anything else you want to talk about but i'll just put this one up here uh, robert piscatelli says would you ever consider doing a george lucas video i.e before star wars what do you think patrick uh pre star wars george lucas uh, I, uh, Robert, I appreciate that because as, as we know, I am never going to make another star Wars video. Um, <laughs> uh, I realized the way I, the tone of my voice there, it sounded like I was like cryptically hinting that there is a star Wars video coming up. No, there yes. is not, there is genuinely not a single thing about star Wars planned for It's just, I, I, I'm not going to do it. Um, that said it has been, I don't think I've watched THX or, American graffiti since I was like 16 or 17. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so if I revisit them, I, I could, uh, it could happen. It's just been so long that, um, I, I, I can't say, so I, no plans, but it's totally possible. All right. Well, Patrick, if that is it, I think we can wrap it up for today. We really appreciate all the basically 300 people in the chat room joining us right now. Watching yeah. this, obviously, if you're watching this, you likely have seen Patrick's latest video about Christopher Nolan. Be sure to check that out. And uh, also uh, check out my channel at youtube.com slash Dave Chensky. This Dave Chen SKY. We'll link to it below uh, where Patrick and I will be doing a review of Inception on the occasion of its 10th anniversary. And you'll yes. find a bunch of other videos by myself. Um, until next time, Patrick, you want to take us out? Uh, yeah, everyone, thanks for so much for tuning in. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. Hope we got to your questions. Um, Stay safe out there, wear masks, and we'll be back soon.